All right. So chapter 14 covers linear regression. You may have noticed we skipped a bunch of chapters, um, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Um, that's mostly because um, I think that this is one of the more important parts of things that we use in real business all the time. And But what we did skip over was some buildup to this concept. So there may be a few things that are confusing, but I think we'll get through it just fine. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. All right. So what we're going to cover in this course is simple linear regression. There's also something called multiple linear regression um, that we're not going to deal with. The big difference, okay, is that with simple linear regression, we have what's called a, an independent and a dependent variable. And dependent just means that one variable is based upon or dependent on the other variable, okay? So we call the independent variable X and the dependent variable Y. Again, you learned this probably in Algebra 2 uh, in high school. So we're going to have one independent variable and one dependent variable. And uh, we're not going to get into multiple regression because honestly, computers do it all for us. Um, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. Uh, I think it's beyond what we need to cover right now. All right. So here is our simple linear regression equation. You'll see y hat, which if you remember what y hat means from earlier parts, it means the expected or estimated of value of y for a given value of x, OK? So the idea is, if we can take a sample of x and y values, then we should be able to extend that sample out and say, well, what's an expected value of y for any other given value of x? And if we can do that, then we have a lot of power in predicting what might happen, OK? So um, you learned this in school as y equals mx plus b, or the equation for a straight line. Okay, you probably learned this in high school, maybe even middle school, for those of you who took like algebra in, in seventh grade or eighth grade. Uh, but they write it a little bit differently where they write y hat. So the expected or estimated value of y equals b sub zero, which is the y-intercept. That's what we would call b in our high school equation, plus b1 times x, where b1 is the slope. Right, we always learned it as y equals mx, where m was the slope, plus b, where b was the y-intercept. Okay, so it's the same formula. That's what, you know, it seems confusing, but it's actually the same thing you've already learned. So in a simple linear regression, that would be a positive linear relationship, right, where the slope is b1, or sometimes they call it beta 1. And the intercept is b sub zero. There'd be a negative linear relationship. So we'd expect the slope to be negative. And there would be where the slope is zero, right? So the, the line uh, is just really going to be based on the y-intercept. Again, you've done this at times in your life. Um, the, the thing with this, though, is we know that when we have real xy relationships in in business or in other areas, that they don't always come out to a perfect line. So regression is this process of saying, which line is the best fit for all of these X, Y relationships, okay? So what we use is something called the least squares method. Um, or we can just use a computer to do it. But first, let me show you how we do least squares. This looks confusing, but least squares is just the, or the, the criteria for least squares is just the sum of a given value of y or an observed value of y minus the estimated value of y, what we think y should be for that value of x, and then squared, okay? And it's the sum of all of those differences. That sounds confusing, but let me walk through an example here in a minute. And then here's the formula for the slope. Again, that looks scary, but by now we've seen enough of these equations that it's not too freaky. It's just the sum of the value of x for a given observation minus the mean of x times the value of y minus the mean of y. So the sum of all those divided by the sum of the given value of x 
minus the mean of x squared. In other words, if I was given a bunch of data and I was given that formula, I should I could be I could work that out. It's not as scary as it looks. I I swear mathematicians are like, you know what we should do? Let's throw some Greek letters in there to freak people out. And then once you realize, oh, that just means some. It's not as scary. But I remember first time I saw stuff like this, I was just like, it's like instead of being like, I can dig into this and figure it out part by part, I'm just like, it's too much. I can't do it. It's like seeing a page of text and you're just like, no way, I'm not reading that. All right. And then the formula for the y-intercept in a, an estimated regression equation is y bar, which is the average of y, minus b1 times x bar. Okay, so again, pretty doable. But let's go through an example. So this is Armin's pizza parlor. So they collect a sample of 10, uh, or a sample from 10 Armin's pizza parlor restaurants near college campuses. Um, so for an ith observation, meaning a given observation, um, x is the side of the student population and y is the quarterly sales. So what they're saying is, if we look at 10 different restaurants and we compare the size of the student population to the average quarterly sales, can we predict then, is there enough of a linear relationship here that we could use this information to predict a relationship between student population of the college and quarterly sales. That could help us then as we start to choose where else we're gonna put our restaurants, right? We would find campuses of the optimal size. So here's their data. We have student population in thousands. Um, and then we have quarterly sales. So restaurant one, that's a pretty small college, about 2000 students, it's smaller than us even. Um, and their quarterly sales are 58 restaurant two, et cetera. So you can see there appears to be, just by eyeballing it, a positive linear correlation between those numbers, right? As the number of, as the student population goes up, uh, the quarterly sales generally goes up. We can see some examples where it doesn't. This one has less sales than these. And we see here both that have around 8,000, but one has a lot more sales. So I don't know, maybe they sell a lot of weed at that school, so people want more pizza. I don't know. Do you think there's a correlation between weed use and pizza sales? I don't know. We have to check, like, does Colorado have better weed sales overall because they were the first ones to make recreational legal? Or if it was other, that's a good natural experiment. Like, when recreational became legal and usage spiked, like, were there snack spikes, too? I don't know. It's worth checking out, all right? All right, so sometimes when you're going to do a linear regression, it's helpful to like create this like summary of the numbers. So what they did is for each observation, they just did the X and the Y, and then they did the X, the value of X minus the average of X. So they just took all those and averaged them, right? And then the value of Y minus the average of Y. And then in essence that, in essence that, and then that squared. So that's kind of like a what? One, two, three, four, five, six number summary that gives them all the info they would need to calculate this by hand, right? So that's how a lot of people would attack this is just because you're given this data, right? These first three columns, and then it's pretty easy with Excel to put in the formula there, 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 fill it down and, and you have all the info you need. Um, so the slope, they just took the sum of, of the given values of x minus the mean of x, y minus the mean of y. So they took the sum of each of these. There's their numerator. And then the sum of the x one. And there's their denominator. And that gave them a slope of 5. So that means if you remember back to high school or, or even middle school math, for every you know, that X is going to go up five for every one Y, right? That's the slope. And then the Y intercept is just Y minus B1X. So 130 times five minus 14 is 60. So now they have a formula and they could draw a straight line. Y equals 60 plus 5X. Oh, they're not going to show us a picture of it. That's stinky. But we would just say, 
y when uh, x is 1, then y would equal 65, right? We would expect it to. If x is 2, then y, or y would equal 70, et cetera, right? We could do that math pretty easy. And we could plot that and draw a straight line. And that line would be something that we could then use to predict a given value of y, I mean, a, an estimated value of y for a given value of x, okay? Now, it's not perfect, right? It's based upon averages, and so it's not going to be perfect. We saw that in our own real data where there were some values of X that would have not yielded us the expected value of Y. I mean, right here. But it's based on averages, so it's going to be a decent estimate. Generally speaking, you're just like, man, I think we just want to build our pizza parlors next to bigger schools, which I, you probably could have guessed without all the math, right? But... Um, it'd be interesting to see if there was sometimes some of these have what they call a curvilinear relationship, which means this linear relationship holds until a certain point and then it starts to curve back. Right. And then you kind of have this equilibrium point, like this is the optimal size we want to build by. Like maybe if you get much bigger than 26,000, maybe if you go to like ASU where there's 80,000 students, there's just too much competition by other restaurants or something, you know? So you, you, you would need data to 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 do that whoa good catch um all right so we could use excel to do this for us all right you don't have to memorize it right now we'll, we're going to walk through an example version of this on wednesday but i just want to show you how we would use excel so here's all of that data put into an excel spreadsheet you could of course just use excel to calculate that kind of six number summary that you would need right? Um, but you can also use Excel to create what's called a, a scatter diagram. So you just select the cells, B2 through C11, and then you click insert and click insert a scatter. Um, and then when it asks you what type of scatter diagram you want to do, you just click scatter. It's a subtype of scatter charts. Then you edit the scatter diagram. And if you don't have to do all this part, but you can name it Armand's Pizza Palace, or Pizza Parlors. But what matters here is clicking chart elements. And then when chart el elements comes up, you can choose axis titles, grid lines, and the biggie is this one, trend line. Because this trend line is gonna give you that formula, the Y equals MX plus B that we went through all that trouble to calculate a minute ago, it'll just give it to you. So even if you don't give it titles and stuff, if you say, show me the trend line, it'll do it for you. Um, and again, you can edit it to do the axis titles and the and and then you can format the trend line. And here's where you tell it, display the equation on the chart. And then it comes out like this and it gives you that boy. And that's the thing that really matters. The Y equals five X plus 60. Now, Interestingly, Excel gives it to you in the same format you always learned it in school, right? Where, where we have the y-intercept is the last thing, as opposed to how it showed it to us in this book, where it had reverse, where it had the intercept and then the, sl the slope times x. And if we look at this, we could see this line is going to intercept y at 60, right? Um, which in theory means even if a place had a student population of zero, we would still expect quarterly sales of 60,000, meaning just, I guess, the population around. Don't know if it would hold true, but that we could use that for an estimate. And again, you look at this, this is a pretty darn good correlation, right? Like that line didn't have to be snapped weirdly in there. Sometimes you'll see like a way more dispersed pattern in a scattered gram. And then you look at that line and you're like, that line... Well, that is the least squares. In other words, you, you took the square of each of the difference between all the real, all of those and the average. This one's pretty darn good, which means I think it would have some decent predictive quality for us. Um, and again, we recognize like bigger student population, more pizza sales. All right. So uh, the coefficient of determination tells us the relationship between these three numbers. And the three numbers are the total sum of squares, okay? So the sum of squares is 
another way of saying a, the given value of what the sum of a given value of y minus the average of y squared. We call that the sum of squares. Okay. And then the sum of the expected value, or not the, the, the calculated expected value of y minus the average of y is called the, the sum of squares due to regression, or sometimes it's called SSR. Okay. And then finally, the sum of the given value of y minus the calculated value of y squared, we call that the sum of squares due to error. So this is a little confusing and a new concept, okay? Don't worry too much about it, other than recognizing that the sum of our, of our uh, given value of y, okay, minus the, the, the average of y, is going to equal the sum of the sum of squares due to regression and the sum of squares due to error. Don't worry too much about it other than I'll show you how to calculate the numbers and how to use Excel to get them, but know they're there. So our coefficient of determination, sometimes called our R squared, okay, is the sum of squares due to regression divided by the total sum of squares. In other words, what we're saying is when we do the regression analysis, this creates a line, okay? Let me go way back to the line. This creates this line. And you'll see this line isn't a perfect fit for all of the dots. Each of the dots, remember, recognizes what we expect the value of y to be for a given value of x. OK? So when we take this expected value, and then we take the sum of those, and we subtract that from the mean minus the given value, we come up with this line that is the best fit. And so the difference between this, the, what we expect, and this mean or average is that, that, that sum of squares related to the regression model or the difference between where the line comes out in the middle and where we would expect it to come out. Does that kind of help? Don't worry too much. If you understand that, at least conceptually, that there's going to be some difference as we calculate, well, what would y be if th if x was was 60? Well, y would be 0. Well, what if x was whatever? We get these dots, then we draw a line that's a perfect average, and the difference between that line and where each of these ones we've plotted comes out is the difference based on regression, okay? And so we take that difference based on regression, divide it by the total sum of squares, and that gives us, in essence, a percentage number, which is the difference based on regression divided by the total sum of squares, okay? And we call that our coefficient of determination. Again, if you're like, I don't know if I can wrap my brain around that today, don't. Just wrap your brain around how to calculate it, right? And then as you use it, you start to be like, oh, I see what's happening. And if you don't ever use it again, then it doesn't matter, right? So just know how to calculate it. So the R squared for Armin's Pizza Parlor is... 0 0.9027. And the the coefficient of determination, what it tells us is how strong that relationship is, right? If it was a one, it would mean that all of the difference in the system was because of regression and not because of error, okay? The further it is away from one, the more of the difference is coming from error and not from regression, okay? So an R squared of one would, in essence, you'd see like the dots and the line would just pass through all the dots perfectly, right? There'd be no, no error. Um, so we would say, so this is a valuable number in the sense that it tells us how good that correlation is. And like I said, when we looked at it, we could tell it was pretty good. In other words, that line was pretty close to the dots, but it's a 0.90. Uh, Well, what it would mean is that we are comfortable saying that most of the change in y, the in the um, quarterly sales, is due to the change in x, the student population, right? The lower that r squared, 
the less comfortable we are saying it's due to the change in X and not due to some other factor. Does that help? So our correlation coefficient or R squared helps us to feel more confident about the fact that changes in Y are due to changes in X. Remember, we have a dependent and an independent variable. So X, the independent variable, as it changes, Y also changes. And our question is, well, how much of that change in Y is because X changed? Yeah, it tells you that that it's highly likely that putting your another store near a, a college with a larger student population is going to give you more sales. Yeah? All right. All right. So we can use Excel to tell us the coefficient of determination. We've already got the trend line option. So if we format the trend line, then we can just choose select uh, that we can just choose display R squared on the chart. So it just tells us the R squared. So again, we don't have to worry about all that math. Excel will do it for us, okay? And again, this isn't a math class, right? This is a understanding relationships class, really, I think. I mean, we've learned some math and we've done a lot of math, but we really wanna be comfortable using the tools and Excel's the biggest tool that's out there. So if, if we can do that, um, and I've heard that students now who've gone to ASU and they've come back after taking like a, an analysis course, they're like, they're like, man, that business stats class helped me, not because we did the exact same calculations we did in there, or there was some formula I remembered, but just my confidence to be able to sort of think analytically, break down an equation and make a calculator in Excel that I could then put in the various inputs, that was really helpful to me. So that's my goal. Like if you guys don't memorize any of this, I'm fine. If you feel more confident in your ability to break down a problem into different parts and make yourself a, a calculator to do it, then we've been successful as a class. Um, all right. And then the correlation coefficient is just is the R. So if the coefficient of determination is R squared, the correlation coefficient is the square root of that. OK, it's R. So uh, they had like four slides and I just took it down to like one or two here where we just take the coefficient of determination. And we do the square root of it. That's it. All right. So as you can imagine, when we come up with a point estimate for Y based on a given value of X, someone might have the question, which is, well, how accurate is that value of Y? Is there some interval that Y, you know, if X is this, it's 90% likely Y will be between this and this, or if X is this, it's 95% confident that Y would be between this and this, okay? And so this is just taking the same concept, but kind of to the next level to give us a confidence interval, which could give us the interval estimate of a mean value of Y for a given value of X, or a prediction interval to predict an individual value of Y for a new observation corresponding to a given value of X. In other words, if I have now done this regression and I can see that on any given place I have, if, if it's X, then I can use my little Y equals MX plus B to calculate what Y would be. And then we could say, well, what if I wanna be 95% confident of what Y would be? Then I can create an interval and say, well, why is, if X is this, Y is gonna be between here and here with 95% confidence, okay? And again, you could probably just off the top of your head, think of the value of that in a business scenario for, you know, again, we'll go back to the pizza restaurant. If, if we have this many students, then our sales is, is going to be between here and here. And we're 95% confident of that because then you can start to say, well, how much sales do I need to be, to have the profit I need? And, you know, I can look at that and say, Here's the magic number of students where I'm, I know I'm going to be safe. Not no, but I'm 95% confident. Obviously, I like being 95% confident. I like being 99% confident. Um, I like being 100% confident, but that doesn't exist. Um, don't you wish this was available for relationships? Like, like what is, how could I be 99% confident that if I go in for the kiss right now, she will not reject me, right? Like that. You could just like calculate, you could like be in the movie and you could like look over at her. And then you could come over here and like get on Excel and be like, now's the moment, right? And you could go in and only a 1% chance that she was like, whoa, I'm watching this or whatever. All right. 
Or maybe she just isn't into smooching in public places. I don't know. Okay, but you could factor all that in. But it's not there, sadly. So we do face rejection in the real world. Um, all right. So don't get like too crazy about this. Again, we'll look at an example, but let me just kind of walk through. So the confidence interval estimate is just the expected value or the, the estimated, I should say, value of Y plus the T of alpha divided by two. Remember alpha is one minus our confidence level, right? Um, times S, which is the standard deviation of Y hat, okay? Which is that, again, that, ex that estimated value of Y. Sounds super crazy, but not really. Okay, so that's for the confidence interval. And then for the estimate or the prediction interval is just the estimated value of Y. And remember, we find that by plugging in the given value of X into our Y equals MX plus B, solve for, solve for Y, and we get the estimated value of Y for that given value of X. So we take that estimated value of y plus or minus the t score of alpha divided by two times the s of the predicted value of y. This is where it gets a little kooky, right? Because we know that, that standard deviations are usually for a whole group. So how do I find the standard deviation of a given value, right? Um, and it's not as crazy as you think because we've already done this work, okay? So the confidence coefficient one minus alpha and the T of alpha divided by two is based on a T distribution with uh, N minus two degrees of freedom. So this is where it's gonna throw you off. We did N minus one before. The reason we did N minus one is because we were working with a single variable. Now we're working in data sets with X and Y, two variables. So we're gonna use N minus two. So if you ever like crap, I don't remember if it's N minus one or N minus two, the question is, are, well, how many variables are you working with? If you have X and Y variables, then it's N minus two. If you just have the X variable, one variable, and minus one degrees of freedom. So to do a point estimation, so to predict quarterly sales for a new restaurant, Armand's considering building near Talbot College, a campus with 10,000 students. They're going to take, to, to find Y, an estimated value of Y, they'll take 60, which is the Y-intercept, plus 5, which is the slope, times, they just took 10, they just took the zeros off, they come out to 110. So they estimate quarterly sales of $110,000 for an X, in other words, a campus size of 10,000 students. That's pretty simple with what we've already learned. Now the question is, how? what's our confidence interval for that? So this looks crazy, but it's not as crazy as it sounds, okay? So to find the estimated standard deviation for that estimated value of y, we just take the standard deviation times the square root of one over n plus the value of x minus the average of x times the sum of those, and we come out to 4.95. Again, we'll do an example of it. It's not as scary as it looks. So now to find our 95% confidence interval, we just take that 110,000, again, they just took the zeros off, plus or minus, the T score of the alpha divided by two. What what is our alpha? Was this a 95% confidence? Did it tell us? That would have been nice. Yes, it's 95% confidence. It didn't tell us though, which is 2.306 times the standard deviation. So now it's 110 plus or minus 11.415. So between 98,585 and 121,415. Again, the value of that is, it gives us a range of what Y would be for a given value of X with a certain level of confidence, okay? And then slightly different is the prediction interval, okay? Um, so remember the confidence interval and the prediction interval. So again, we take the standard deviation of the predicted value, which is one plus one over N, and then work that out. We come out with 14.69. The Y hat is 
is 110 plus or minus the T of alpha divided by two times the standard deviation of the predicted. So you'll see this is a bigger range. And the reason it's a bigger range is because we're basing it off of one predicted value instead of the average, okay? All right, one last thing. Excel has what's called a regression tool, uh, which can just do a lot of this work for us. Not all of it though, unfortunately. Um, so, and we'll go, we'll go over an example of how to do this also. So we click the data tab on the ribbon. So up on the top on Excel. And then in that, will somebody pull up Excel and try this? I wanna see if they, last year when they loaded Excel, they did not have this tool pack analysis tool pack added. And so we weren't able to do it. And we had to go in and, and install the tool pack each time. And then it would wipe the computers clean at midnight and you have to reinstall it the next day. It was a pain in the butt, pain in the bottom. Um, so does it have does it have data or data or however you like to pronounce it? And and does it have in an analyze group? I don't see it. Yeah, so I'll show you guys on Wednesday how to add the analysis tool pack. If you have Excel on like your home computer, you add it once and then it's always there as a tool for you. If, if you're on these, apparently we'll have to add it before we start. It only takes a few seconds, um, um, but anyway. And then we re choose regression from the list of analysis tools. And then in essence, you just in, you can put your Y range, your X range. You can select labels if you want. You can check the confidence level you want. Select output where you want it to put the information. And it gives you, well, that's showing you how you do it all. And it gives you this output where it gives you the R squared. It gives you the standard error. It gives you the SS, which is, I'll show you how these line up with the, the SST and SSR. It gives you a significance level if you need it. It gives you the intercept and the slope, et cetera. So it gives you a lot of the information we would use. Okay, so some people prefer this tool, other people are like, it only takes me a second to put in that formula and pull it down and then it's all good. So, but I'll show you again, we'll walk through how to use this when we do our guided. Um, and that's it. So this chapter, it's, it's kind of a combination of new stuff with some concepts from the past. Um, but again, the reason I skipped to it is I really think it's a valuable tool for anybody going into business, just being able to understand basic regressions and how they're worked. Again, in real life, you'll probably have people calculating the regressions for you. And so you'll just be looking at the numbers, right? Um, or, you know, what the estimates are, but to have some underlying understanding of how they arrived at that is valuable to you, especially as a manager. If some of you go into analysis, you might be doing this and, and uh, it's the kind of thing that the more you work with it, the easier it is because well, you're working with it. So that's it. Let's see.